o'clock. Yeah, three o seven. Da, 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 da. Going live now, she said, and then when this is live, I will point to you. There it goes. We are live. Welcome to the RV Repair Club, our go live event. It is January 25th, and uh, it is about five degrees here in northern Iowa, and it's supposed to get down to zero and below zero. So anybody have a plane ticket to Tampa, I would appreciate it. Anyway, uh, we're ready to get started. We've had a, a busy month. Uh, this month I did a show in Greensboro, North Carolina. We had uh, probably the second best attendance I've had in probably 15 years. Over almost 10,000 people came through. We went to Chicago in the second week. And uh, last week we were in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Saturday was a zoo. We had a ton of people in there. So it was a lot of fun and a lot, a lot of people getting ready to go camping. So with that, let's start our questions. And Angie has a very unusual one for the first one. So read that back to me again. Not the whole thing, just the, kind of the gist of it. Okay. Um, so the person said that um, we would like to know who will help us with a replacement RV that has over 30 defects, some uh, very serious like electrical problems. Um, they said they're being told that a person at the manufacturer who they feel is bullying them, um, that they're only allowed to go through him for any warranty repair, questions, possible repairs, replacement parts, etc. Um, she said this person is also, uh, this is the same person that has also breached our original settlement contract with at least 13 different breaches, including fraud on his part. Okay. Well, the, the, you know, the, I, evidently this is fairly new motorhome or RV. Uh, they didn't tell what brand or make or anything nope. like that. Um, I would imagine that it's kind of fringing on the lemon law um, a little bit. But I do know having worked at Winnebago, if you do have an RV that is in the warranty period and uh, it needs repairs that um, to be done on it, it does need to go to a dealership, one of their authorized dealership. Doesn't, doesn't mean you have to stay at the same dealership. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's a combination of the manufacturer and the dealership uh, working together to get it right. And... Uh, everything needs to be documented. You have to have the, the authorized parts, the service. They, you know, you, you get it into some independent places, and they could be double the warranty or double the hours and so forth. So, I, I, I would say you, you, you're going to have to work through the manufacturer. But what I would suggest, this is not something that any club or organization really is going to be able to help you with. Uh, it's probably time to get a lawyer involved. Um, and uh, you know, just just start off with uh, somebody at the manufacturer, other than the person that you're dealing with. Maybe go to their supervisor, and just say, "Here's documentation. You have to have everything documented. Here are all the uh, the issues that we've had uh, looked at, but not fixed, not addressed. Um, anything that they said, the breaches that you um, have have indicated, all that stuff." Um, you know, I typically like to try and work it out through a manufacturer, but not knowing enough of this history, that would be something that you're you're going to have to work through uh, some type of a representative, like a lawyer, to get this thing. Uh, you know, sit down and just say, well, "Here's what's expected. Here is what we are owed." So. Okay. Uh, next question. I have a 2005 Winnebago Voyage. Going down the road, engine light came on engine started missing or bucking air message said reduced engine power this happened twice after driving about 20 miles boyer truck replaced the gas pedal with its attached sensor i'm afraid to drive it what can i do uh i don't know who boyer trucking is uh if you have a check engine light that comes on and gives you an error code you should be able to hook into the computer and find out exactly what it is I have never heard of uh, a gas pedal with a sensor. To me, it, it's going to be more something in the engine um, electronics itself. Um, you know, it could be something as simple as, as water in the fuel. Um, if it's in the cold weather like this, it could be it, it freezing with, uh, with poor fuel. Um, <clears throat> I would definitely get in touch with uh, a dealer that you bought it from and find out who their uh, chassis manufacturers. If it's a 2005 Voyage, um, I would 
probably guess that it is a Ford chassis. And uh, so you need to have, uh, you know, and what you might want to do is get in touch with Winnebago Owner Relations. They have a really good relationship with the Ford dealership over in Britt that's called Pritchard Ford. That's who they use for all their chassis manufacturing stuff. And uh, they would probably be able to eat, at least get you into a Ford dealership that is familiar with that. Um, you know, you, you take it into a lot of these truck places and they, you know, they may be fairly good mechanics, but if they don't know that F53 chassis and that V10 engine, um, you're going to be you're going to be asking for some trouble, I think. Okay, someone asked, how do I clean the toilet below the flush thing? Well, I'm assuming you're you're looking at uh, the typical RV toilet has a pedal that you push down and a spade valve that either rotates or slides across. And they're probably looking at ways to get down into underneath that section, which is the channel going to your black water tank. You can do a couple different things. Um, you know, push the, the foot feed down um, and use a uh, toilet bowl cleaner, one of the brushes, get down in there. A lot of people will use a uh, black water flush um, rod or stick, and it's just a plastic wand. I guess it's a wand it's called. You put on the end of a garden hose and, and stick that down and just do a nice flush all the way around there. You can leave the valve closed partially so it doesn't splash back up inside. But you should be able to, it's plastic. Um, you know, just about any of your toilet cleaners can be used. There are some of the, uh, like scrubbing bubbles and, and other brands that you just spray on, open that valve up, spray it on. I would, I would shut the water off to the toilet so because when you push that thing down it's going to want to push water in and so if you want to do any kind of the the spray foam that sits on it for quite a while i would shut the water to that off and open that up and spray it really good let it sit for a while so you should be able to get down in there and clean it okay alan asked i have a 2001 rex hall erebus the weight is approximately 22,000 pounds what size jack do i need to change a flat tire it is 36 feet. Well, um, you know, you're going to have different, it, it depends on front versus back, so I would go with the back. And, you know, even, even though overall you're 22,000, you're going to be jacking up one corner uh, of that unit. And, um, you know, so I would say you're going to have to look at the, what the GAWR of the, of the back is. That's going to be your heaviest axle. Probably somewhere in about the... I would guess the 14,000 pound range is what that, that uh, back axle is going to weigh. So you're only going to do about half of that, but uh, you know, you're, you're probably still want to be somewhere in about the eight to 10,000 pound range. Personally, uh, I just get roadside assistance that, you know, jacking a unit up that heavy, trying to take that wheel off, trying to break those nuts loose, uh, taking the wheel. Uh, that's pretty dangerous. Um, you know, most of the people that, that I have talked to um, don't even want to mess with that. They, they, bring, they bring a tire because you get roadside assistance and chances are they don't have that same tire size, brand, tread, everything. <clears throat> but uh, I would just look at something like CoachNet and, and get roadside assistance. It's not that expensive and it's a lot less expensive than having that thing fall off and doing some damage to you or the motorhome. Okay. okay. Someone asked, what is your opinion of the RV armor roof? I am thinking of having my grand design reflection 303 RLS fifth wheel done. Um, it, it, I, I wouldn't, you know, you probably have a, I don't see the rubber fiberglass. I don't know what the grand design uses on theirs. Most of them use a rubber membrane. And if that rubber material is good, I don't know that you really need to go with an aftermarket coating system on it. Um, you know, a lot of times with the rubber roof, all you have to do is once a year, you wash it with Dawn dish soap um, and water and then condition it with a Dicor conditioner that you mop on. And the thing will last a long, long time. You get a lot of these aftermarket uh, products that come in. Um, you know, Dicor has one that is, is a reconditioning and it's just a white roll-on liquid. Now, if my rubber roof material was starting to deteriorate and it was turning black, um, 
pinholes, a lot of you know, a lot of issues with it. Then I would I would install it. That's what they're designed for. But I think uh, you know some of the stuff you pay a lot of money to put a protection on that you can you know pretty much uh, make that rubber roof last if you just take a little bit of care of it. Having said that, you can put that that uh, system on and never have to worry about it for whatever how many years they say. So you have to decide if the money's worth the labor savings that you would have. We're waiting for more questions. Waiting for more questions. Well, let's just talk a little bit about um, the last couple CoachNet articles that we put together were for uh, camping in cold weather, and uh, we had some um, some tips that you could you could do. One of the things that all right, guys, I got a new challenge for you. Oh, an egg challenge. Grab an egg. we got an egg challenge from Angie from YouTube. So. Okay, um, you know the biggest thing in camping in, in cold weather right now is the fact that you need to um, make sure you insulate the windows. You need to make sure you find a way to extend the life of your batteries, your LP. You're going to use a lot of uh, uh, LP with with the furnace. Um, we did have a couple products. If you don't have dual pane windows, the um, just the window insulation you get. I got this at Menards. Um, that it was uh, actually it was Ace Hardware, I believe. Anyway, they both have them. It's just the film. You put the tape around the outside of the window or inside. Put it outside the frame of the window. You put the uh, um, shrink wrap or the plastic on, and just use a hair dryer, and that'll give you a barrier, um, you know, an air cushion in between, help insulate it. I have a lot of people that use this. This is called Reflectix. And this, you just cut and fill the entire window um, to put this in the inside of it. It's just a, a nice little insulating blanket that really works well. Um, I do know several people that use the RVs to um, go kite skiing. Um, they, they also do uh, ice fishing and uh, cross, country, cross country skiing, that type of stuff. So we do see a lot of people doing activities. One other thing, I'm going to pull this up. There are a couple products. This one happens to be a uh, Mr. Buddy, Mr. Heater, portable buddy. And all this is is just a, an LP tank, a small little canister here that's screwed into this. And it just simply turn it on and light it. I'm not going to do that right now if I run my glasses here. But um, it just does a nice little glow in the front here. And what I really like about these is that you don't typically need to heat the entire RV all day and all night, front to back. You know, the living room area in the daytime, the bedroom area in the night. So I can I can bring the the overall heat temperature down inside that RV and supplement with this. And what I like about this is there's no carbon dioxide that comes off of this. Uh, there is there is no uh, dioxide or monoxide, carbon monoxide. Excuse me, and very little condensation, so it's not a moist heat that you see in a lot of those heaters that come out. So I don't get condensation on the windows and in the cabinets and so forth. Uh, Olympian is another is a very popular brand that uh, is very similar to this. But, so anyway, we got some questions that came in. Yes, Gary asked, I have a 2008 Georgetown XL 378TS. All of a sudden, I cannot flush my black water tank. When I attach the hose and turn it on, there isn't any water flow, but immediately leaks at the ho or at the hose connection. In looking for the check val valve in the line, I know some reading I've done shows the valve in a closet or under the bathroom sink, somewhere higher than the black water tank. Is it possible it is behind the panel where the flush hose attaches? I can't see back there without tearing it apart. Thanks. Oh. Um. If your black water tank, so let me walk through this again. He, he goes to connect the hose onto the bayonet, pulls the valve, and nothing happens, but he's getting a leak where? At the hose? Um, okay. okay, so in looking for the check valve, um, so it says, when I attach the hose and turn it on, there isn't any water flow, but it immediately leaks at the hose connection. Okay. I don't. I, 
I'm not sure. And so the very beginning says that he, he, it doesn't drain, right? Not flush by black water. Flush. Okay. All right. I, that, now I get it. He's talking about the black water flush valve. I was thinking flush like the toilet and pull like the valve. So, yeah, um, what you typically are going to have with that is, uh, in fact, I have one right here. There, there's several different models. This happens to be um, a black water flush valve that you would just drill a hole into the side of the tank and you would pop it in and it would hook here. Some of them have little wands and a variety of, of other different things inside them and then they would have a hose that comes to a place that's a little more accessible to get at, uh, get a hose at it rather than you know, way up underneath a compartment or something. So with this you have you know, basically a check valve in, in here. You've got another valve inside this one that hooks into there. You've got a screen that goes in here. So there, there's a variety of different places that you can see that can get clogged. And so you're basically going to have to get in and just kind of take each component apart. Keep in mind, when you hook up water at the campground site or your dump site, it's always going to be hard water. So that means you're going to have rust, calcium, lime, all that stuff that, that's going to be uh, blocking. And you've got these screens in here, plus even the little ports sometime that are, um, that are in these. It's hard to see this in here. but uh, So I've got this one here alone. I've got four different places. And I don't believe this has ever been put on, so I can, <laughs> I can show you. It should flow through there pretty freely. And that screen, notorious for getting plugged. So I, I would walk through those and I'm not, I find think it. you might be not knowing where to find that. Okay. Because it says I'm looking for the check valve in the line. I know some reading I've done shows the valve in a closet or under the bathroom sink somewhere higher than the black water tank. Is it possible it's behind the panel where the flush hose attaches? I can't see back there without oh, tearing it yes, apart. Yes, it would be it would be behind the panel because like I said you you, you've got this that's going to be out in an area that's easy to get to, and then you've got a panel, and then the rest of it's going to be inside going to the tank. So I, I would say more than likely it's going to be behind that panel because normally you don't have to get in there and do anything with those, but this time you obviously do. Okay. Uh, Dave, Thanks for the clarification. Dave asked, have a 2013 Winnebago Vista on a frequent basis the auto levers won't raise correctly. All raised, but the rear driver's side. It takes several attempts to get up 100%. Dealers get it to function after a couple of attempts and say nothing is wrong. Is there a fail-safe way to get the lever operate correctly? Uh, chances are, you. I would think you have a Lippert system on that. I'm, I'm not sure. They used HWH up to a certain point, but I don't think it was past 2008 or even maybe a little bit before that. Uh, they went with a variety of different components, but Lippert is pretty much the main one. Usually what that is is there's a seal somewhere that is not allowing the, if, if it's a hydraulic system, which I'm assuming it's the Vista, that um, you, you've, got a, you've got a seal that's starting to go bad or, or even something in the leg. And my, what I would do is I would contact uh, Winnebago Owner Relations to start with find out the type of system that you have. Uh, Lippert is outstanding for their technical support and going through. Um, I would say that you probably, what's happening is you're going to a dealer that that maybe is just trying to clean it up real good and, and get it to operate a little bit, but it probably needs some seals. Not the kind at the zoo. I just had to throw that in. All right, next question. I have a 2008 Four Winds Hurricane Ford F53 dash slash uh, V10. Mm -hmm. And after a storm, the side marker lights and tail lights were off. Found a burnt fuse under the dash and another under the hood. After replacing both, the lights came on but won't go off until I turn off the chassis power. Where do I start to diagnose? Think it could be a headlight switch or question mark. Uh, that one's, that one's a, a, those are tough. Those are gremlins. Uh, if the light is staying on, then somewhere you have a, um, a positive that is, is feeding that. 
with power and it's it's got to be a switch somewhere and I would start by um, first of all taking apart the lights that are staying on and just cleaning everything um, in those components and then um, seeing if you can't get a hold of somebody at Thor owns Hurricane now and just see if you can't get some kind of a wiring diagram. It's very possible it's a headlight switch but you would have to pull that off and uh, you know be able to check it with a meter so you're gonna need to be able to kinda go in and just find out where that that positive you've, you've basically got it's supposed to open which shuts it off and close and if you've got moisture in there and it's corroded and it's the switch has gone bad um, you know then then you're it's staying closed and it's getting power and staying on so you just have to trace that down and, and find that that switch that's closed that's that's a hard one to do without being there and actually trying to walk through each one of those and, and I'm not that familiar with the with the hurricane on on that unit if it's marker light staying on it wouldn't be it, well, it, it's partially chassis but it's their wiring from Thor going through that sidewall to that. Uh, someone asked, has Dave ever heard of FPC, Financial Products Corp? I have not. Um, the, you know, one of the things we're seeing here lately in the, in the RV industry, and, and lately meaning the last three years probably, is the RV industry is really flying. Um, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that jump in when the market's up with warranties and financing and especially financing because there was such a, a you know a, a chaos in 2008 through 2011 all the financial institutions were having issues and, and there wasn't the financing for motorhomes and, and RVs um, so what I would recommend is just to um, check with the dealers see who's using them get some references from them um, you know just find out uh, what you know because right now the dealers are very cautious about who's jumping into the industry because we saw it prior to 2008 so they're doing a lot of research and going with companies that have good financial backing and uh, a good track record not somebody that you know, used to finance boats and now decides that oh look at the RV industry so I'm, I'm not familiar with them but I it's not to say that they aren't a good company I <clears throat> and again I, I don't typically get too involved with financial companies. We're more on the repair side and upgrades and, and kind of leave that to the dealers. So that's all the questions at the moment. Okay. We're waiting for more questions. We got tough ones today. It's like, wow, that's, that's good. Um, so I just want to we'll go through a couple little things here. I found a new toy that I wanted to show everybody. This uh, DeWalt makes a distance finder. It's just a little LED distance finder and I found it at homedepot.com. I have not been able to find it um, in the actual stores but it's kind of a cool little deal. Turn it on here. I don't know if you can see but when I turn this on and I hit the distance finder it shows that I'm about five feet from the ceiling. Three and three quarters to the back wall. Let's see what, if we can do way out here. We are 29 feet, 31 feet to the far wall back over there. And it's just a little, it's, now I got my thing up here. Uh, they come in 75, uh, 100 and 150 foot length. So kind of cool to be able to take this and, and go to, uh, you know, before you pull into a campground, if you got enough room for an overhang that's hanging down, do I have enough room for my motorhome and my my tow vehicle and a tow dolly maybe, um, slide rooms, just kind of a fun little, fun little tool. Um, what else do they have? This is something that's been very popular at the RV shows. This happens to be a infrared thermometer and um, I've got three guys that are on the road with trucks and trailers and we're having a lot of problems with um, bearings and brakes and axles and so every time they stop I have my guys just take one of these and hit the there we show it's 82 
degrees. So when they stop, they hit the hubs, they hit the brake drum, and they hit the tires. And every time we do that, I have them write it down. And so I, what we're finding is what's happening in that. If the hub starts getting hot, and it, if it's 70 degrees outside, it's not uncommon for that hub to be running 90, 95 degrees. But if it hits 125, 130, I know those bearings are starting to get hot, they're getting dry, and they need to be repacked or replaced. That's a lot cheaper to do back at here um, at a service center than it is on the side of the road. If the brakes are starting to get too hot, uh, then, I, then I know that that brake controller is probably set too high. And if the tires get hot, then I'm pretty sure that the tire uh, pressure is starting to, to go down. So nice little piece. Uh, you can get them at Harbor Freight. You can get them at Home Depot, Ace Hardware, variety of different ones. This happens to be a Centec version, and I believe it was only like 1995 save you a lot of headaches out in the road of just once a day while you're traveling the good distances see what's happening in that axle assembly. Any more questions? Nothing yet? Okay. Let's just go through some stuff here. This is one. Um, this is kind of cool. We just, we just uh, put this into the shop or the store um, at the RV Repair Club. When I was writing the RV handbook we, um, I got approached by a company that said I should really feature their product. They put a topical on the windshield. They guarantee it won't crack for a year. And it was really uh, kind of smoke and mirrors. And the windshield company said, if you want a really good product, go look at Clarity Defender. And you can see this one's traveled quite a ways around the country in my little bag of tools. But So I went out to Cleveland, and uh, Nanofilm was the company that our pen now they're called. But they manufacture this Clarity Defender and it is the best wind, windshield treatment I've ever seen in my life. I brought it back, I put it on my truck three years later, it was still working well when I sold my truck, um, traded it in. It, uh, um, it also, it, it, it's the best water repellent, bugs don't stick to the windshield. I put it on 20 Winnebago motorhomes at the rally. Uh, that summer, they all came back the next year and said it was the best thing they've ever had. No bugs stick to the windshield. The windshield wipers actually now work. The problem with motorhome windshields is you get this big windshield and this da -da 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 thing that doesn't seem to ever work uh, for the windshield as it chatters across it. Uh, we have put these on the uh, website and the store. There's a video that shows how to apply it. It works with the uh, actual glass, uh, molecules of the glass and it will last over a year, other than other products that uh, seem to last for about a month, if that. Does not give any uh, haze around the outside edge like some of the other ones do, and it's one of the best ones. In the, you know, one of these will do an entire front windshield for $19.95, and I believe they even have a 10% special going on now, and, uh, or it will do the windshield and all the windows of a truck or car. So again, Clarity Defender, great product to have, easy to apply. Uh, one of the things you do have to make sure is that you don't have any wax on the windshield. So if you have Rain-X or anything that came from a car wash, just pour a little bit of water on the windshield. If it beads up, you got something on there and you need to take uh, Barkeeper's Friend or something, get it off. And that is in the video that is on the site. But uh, great product to have. And Angie says we got some more questions that came in. Gary asked, in my Georgetown, the driver's side fixed window has lost its vacuum and the window is foggy. Do you know of anywhere in the eastern Iowa area that will, will repair replace the window pane? Um, there's a few dealers on eastern side of Iowa. I, I'm, I'm not sure who will do that. Most of them replace it now. Uh, but there are a few places that will take the windshield out, pull the seal out. I don't know of any on the eastern side. Um, that, that will do that, but I would check with a couple window uh, windshield glass companies. Just Google search uh, windshield glass. You also, I um, guess it depends on how far east you, if you go, but there should be Davenport, uh, um, Moline area over there, several in there as well as some dealers, but um, it, it's harder to find companies that will take that out and clean it and put new seal and put it back in because the labor is so high in that that it's usually uh, cheaper to put a new windshield in or a new new glass in. Okay, next question. I have a 2017 open range fifth wheel. 
I just removed the propane tanks and after reinstalling them, I'm not getting propane into the unit. The regulator is still reading red, both tanks full and turned on. Any suggestions? Well, the first thing I would do is shut the tanks off, uh, disconnect them, and let them set for a while, and then uh, connect them back on and open the tanks very, very slow. One of the problems that you get with fifth wheels especially is there is an excess flow valve in the POL or the, the connector. This is the international sign for connector. And uh, it's just a little spring-loaded needle valve, and if you open that too fast, it pushes that and it locks that system up. And sometimes those regulators will go into a safety check mode as, as well. And um, it, it's, it's designed for excess flow. You know, if you get a um, one of your fittings comes undone or the, the, the LP line gets cut and it's just saying, hey, this is too fast, shut it off. And that's a very common thing when you're opening up that deal. So I, I would start by um, doing that. Um, shut the tanks off, disconnect it, let the system sit for, you know, and sometimes it takes a day. Um, and just make sure that everything is kind of reset itself and those should come back to normal and then just open it really, really slow. And so we're waiting for more questions. We're waiting for more questions. All right, so let's go through. I'm just trying to think what was popular at the shows. We had... Um, Oh, this was another fun piece, and <clears throat> I don't have my phone here, but this is a, an endoscope phone um, camera, and all you do is you connect this to an Android. I don't, I don't believe it works on a, uh, um, an Apple phone, but you simply hook this in. There's a little, uh, you have to download the app for it, but once you plug this in, this little probe here is, is a light around the outside of it and a camera and so I can turn it on and off with this here and I can stick this 25 foot lead um, down the back side of a refrigerator or up the refrigerator flew on the back side just to see what's going on in there I can put it in a compartment um, very inexpensive I think this one ran $29.95 um, I do see now they have wireless versions of this as well, so I don't have to have this connected to the phone, but it still has like a 25-foot cable. Um, I have used this where I've got a compartment that's leaking um, in one of the storage compartments. You can put this in without the light on, shut the door, and then put a big spotlight underneath on the, the bottom side of it, and you can actually tell where light is coming into that compartment. Uh, so very handy. Just got it on Amazon.com and uh, um, very popular at the shows. Had a lot of people looking at those. Okay, got some more questions? Okay. All right, someone asked, ooh, this is kind of reverse gear. Um, I have a 37 foot 2018 Coachman. Murata equipped with a hydraulic self-leveling system. Okay. How do I handle the situation in which I've used the leveling system upon arrival in a campsite and the, and the front tires have been lifted off the ground? Okay. Does that sound right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I guess the first thing, I, you know, if the front tires come off the ground, um, I typically don't like to have them suspended, although I see it a lot, but it really depends on, you know, is, is that level. Um, the way your self-leveling system works is it has some kind of a gyro, some kind of a, a meter. It used to be mercury in a little pan in the bottom, and they don't do that anymore because that was very, very inaccurate. But you know, is that pulling those front wheels off and, and is it level? If that's the case and you've got a really bad campsite, then I would highly recommend that you put blocks on underneath the tires just to help support that. I, I just don't like those two posts about this big around providing all the support up on that front, especially when you start walking around or you get any kind of windows in there. Uh, but you know, that, that's the first thing I would check. Make sure where are you at level? Get a, get a level gauge in there and just put it on the floor um, just to see, you know, is that really level? And if it is pulling that, that up, 
um, then get some blocks underneath it. If it's not level, then you're going to have to go in and recalibrate your leveling system. And depending on the brand, if it's Lippert or Power Gear, um, those are the two main ones. Then there is a reset procedure. Just look in your service manual, and it should give you a, a procedure of going through certain buttons and, and recalibrating for uh, what's level. Do you use Barkeeper's Friend to remove hard water spots on RV windows? What's the best product to use? Barkeeper's Friend by far is the best product to use with a uh, either an SOS pad or a Scotch Bright pad. Um, we did a, in fact, and, and then used this afterwards. We took this product up to our local fire station, and they have a huge problem with water spots because they're, you know, using hard water to fight the fires, and then it's floating back over, and sometimes the hot days, and they're constantly fighting those water spots. And so we went in with Barkeeper's Friend, the liquid, not the not the powder, and um, uh, the Scotch Bright pads. And just applied it and went in and, and did that. Uh, I think we also used, uh, I take that back, with that one we used a, a buffer. So we put it on one of those foam 3M buffers that goes on the front because it was a lot faster and we didn't want it all day long. That's right. Uh, but that those, those work great. And then, like I say, I would use this Clarity Defender. Those hard water spots will not stick on. Uh, the fire department a year later said they still had fantastic windshields and love the product. All right, someone asked, how hard is it to remove the carpet and replace it with linoleum? Well, a year and a half later, funny you should ask, it's not hard to remove the carpet. <laughs> the hard part is getting somebody to finish it. Um, it. It's There's two things you have to consider. First of all, if you have slide rooms, you have to be able to put a vinyl in that will withstand that mechanism sliding back and forth. It depends on the brand that you have, the, the slide room that you have. What's underneath? You know, what is that What is that room sliding on? Some of them have rollers. Some of them have just a round kind of a plastic runner or bar that pushes that some of that thinner vinyl will not be able to withstand that. It'll just literally push that and blouse it, it up. Um, so I would, I would definitely get uh, a good a good vinyl that uh, can withstand that, but it's fairly easy. Uh, the only thing we ran into, we took a 2002 Winnebago Brave and we pulled all the carpet out. We had an issue in the kitchen. They had uh, a fake floor in there. It was a it, it was a wood it was a vinyl that was supposed to look like wood planks, glued down with the most god awful glue we could f we ever find. We did use Goo Gone to get most of that out. Uh, the drivers and passenger compartment was the worst. They had some kind of a, a adhesive on there that um, it literally tore the carpet apart, and we had to chisel and heat gun, and uh, that that took a long time. the The other challenge that you'll have in, in getting the carpet off is pretty easy, but um, you got to get it underneath the slide room and be able to get it fastened. And you're not going to be able to staple that. You're going to have to glue that whole thing under there. So you got to be able to get that slide room up. Um, we started off by putting, just kind of prying from the inside. We opened up the slide room to about four inches from fully extended, took a pry bar, lifted it up, put some two by fours under, and just kind of walked our way down. And once we got about halfway done, we had the brilliant idea of that, well, why don't we just go outside and put a jack from the outside underneath up? And that pushed the room up so we could get it underneath. So what I would recommend, if you can get a couple of those Floor jacks like they have in basements um, for for support, and you know you can get them in different sizes, but just like a four foot, three or four foot, and and put a uh, two by four up to span it, and then just crank that up and just keep jacking it up right towards the the edge of the slide room on the outside, and you'll you'll literally push that room up to the point where you can get um, underneath and uh, replace that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just, a, it takes a long time. It's not really hard to do it, it's just, it's very tedious. The other thing you're going to find out about when you replace your, your uh, carpet with any kind of a vinyl, and we used a, a luxury woven vinyl in ours, but any, any place you've got something that meets, like at the stairwells, or the edge of the vinyl in the hallway 
to the wall edge. Carpet is very forgiving. I can ruffle up carpet and I don't have to have anything in there. When I start putting the vinyl, I have got a very sharp edge. And if it's not exactly cut perfect, which it will not be, then you're going to have to put some kind of a trim piece and hide like L, L shaped uh, trim around the stairs, uh, any place you got to splice. So the, those are the those are the considerations you have. Randy asked, "What is a better or best brand for slide out awnings?" Um, I still like the A and E. We put on. Um, an A&E awning on a 2014 Raptor. I think that's on the site. Very easy to do. Um, you already have the awning rail typically up there. So you literally slide the new awning in that rail and you've got two fasteners that go on the outside. I think we put that thing on in about uh, maybe an hour and a half between Steve and I. And uh, very easy to do. I know Carefree has them now. Lippert has them. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've Worked with A and E, the Dometic product for since 1983, four, and uh, you know they've always been a great company to work with. Great material product, um, you know they they uh, they're not the cheapest, but they have the best material. Peter asked, "What is the best roadside service?" Um, I I go CoachNet. Um, I, I like the CoachNet product. They right now have, uh, I think, about probably 75 or more percent of the new motorized vehicles uh, get uh, use CoachNet free for the first year. That's how um, you know respected they are in the industry. I've worked with them for well since uh, probably about '92. I think it was when they first approached Winnebago. I like the fact that they have their technicians are trained technicians, RBIA trained. Um, that they're not just working off a cheat sheet somewhere at a remote location. They uh, have worked very, very hard to partner with tire companies, service companies, tow companies that understand RVs. You don't want just anybody coming in and hooking up the front end of your motorhome and dragging off just the front end. You want somebody that knows what they're doing. And CoachNet has, has uh, really done a great job of, of understanding the industry and partnering with people that know what they're doing with your RV. Okay. Uh, new, uh, do you think that it would be worth the money to replace the tires on my fifth wheel with the Goodyear Endurance RV tires? You hear a lot of bad stories about the cheap tires that come on RVs. Well, it, tires are getting a really bad rap because, you know, we just had it this weekend. Somebody said, well, those cheap Chinese tires. And, you know, it's not the region. Goodyear and... Um, I don't know if Michelin does, but a lot of tire companies have a plant in China. They've got them all over the world. The issue, I, I would not replace the tires unless I had weather checking on the sidewall, if I saw something, kind of an issue with the, with the tread itself. The problem we run into with tires is that they're the most neglected component on an RV. Most people don't check the, the tire pressure. They don't even know what proper pressure is. They don't check the weight that's on there. All that affects the tire and blowouts. And then people blame it on cheap tires. They have, they have no fudge factor over what gross weight rating is, gross axle weight rating. What you need to do is take your RV to a CAT scale. Go to catscale.com, put in your zip code, you'll find them at Flying J's, Pilots, so forth. Find out what weight is on that tire and then go to rvsafety.com, it's www.rvsafety.com and go to their tire guides. The only way you know the proper tire inflation, it's not what's on the sidewall of the tire, that's maximum pressure at maximum weight. If your RV is not at maximum, that, that is not what you want to put in there. So you go weigh the coach, Go to rvsafety.com, go to the Goodyear, Michelin, whatever brand you have on that. Find out the tire brand, the size, dual or single application, what weight, and that's what tire pressure you should have in it. The next thing you want to look at is you want to make sure you're not over gross vehicle weight rating. Your axle is rated to a certain weight, and that tire is rated to that same weight with that axle. And if you're overloading that vehicle, even a couple hundred pounds, which a lot of people think, well, no big deal. 
Well, you could a couple hundred pounds here, and then you don't check the, the uh, um, pressure, and pressure should be checked every time you go on the road. It should be part of your checklist. Uh, there's a RV Safety Education Foundation started off as John Anderson and away we go, and he, was, he blew out several tires on a fifth wheel. And so he went in and had the coach weighed. It was overloaded. He worked with Michelin then and has been weighing coaches for years. For the first 10 years, 75% of all RVs on the road were overloaded in one capacity, whether it was total weight or axle weight, and 75% had underinflated tires. If you, have 10, if you have 10 PSI less than recommended pressure in your tire, you reduce your carrying capacity by, by 25%. So we saw overloaded coaches, underinflated tires, boom. We had lots of problems. Even today, 50% of all RVs are out of those spec at some point. So I don't think it's all the tires. And I would not jump into putting Goodyear tires on it until I have researched properly the tires that are on there, the weight that I've got on that vehicle, make sure that, and, and you know, there, there are sometimes, I don't know who put the tires on. You know, there's times where, they had problems with the, the manufacturer's OEM tires, took it to a local guy, said, oh, yeah, here, I'm going to throw these whatever um, Mastercrafts or whatever they are, and they just aren't rated for the weight, and they aren't rated for uh, the heat that you'll get sometimes, the sidewalls, all that stuff. So before I would start replacing tires, do yourself a favor and, and find out what your weights are. Hey, someone asked. When you are answering the carpet to the linoleum question, do you have to take into account for the for the different in thicknesses with slide rooms? Uh, no, because you're actually going backwards. Um, you know, the question was if when you take the carpet out and you put vinyl, you're going to have thinner vinyl in there. Um, the you know we went in with a very thin pad, so we were going a lot a lot less. So the slide rooms, they just basically are going to glide on the rail of the sidewall itself and on the vinyl. So I, I, I'm not too worried about that. I wouldn't be worried about going the other way. If I was had vinyl and I put carpet and pad in, then I'm putting a thicker piece in that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be used to. Um, I had one more thought when she, when she brought that up about, uh, oh, uh, the, the important thing with the vinyl, though, is make sure you have a good subfloor. When you take that carpet out that was probably stapled, all over the place and I'm glad you brought this up because I, I didn't mention this beforehand but we spent an enormous amount of time taking staples out of the floor because they got happy and any, especially around where the slide room they didn't want that to push so it was and staples in the carpet you don't see you know that's the beauty of carpet it hides so many things I can staple it all over I want to and but then when I go to pull it out you know I had all these and then some gouges and, and where the vinyl's at. So make sure you got a good subfloor. You may even have to go in and put a, an eighth inch Luon sheet down um, to, get you, to get a good smooth surface to adhere to. Okay. Someone asked, is the tile flooring put in RVs the same as a home tile or is it a lighter, different material? I have a Safari Trek that has half tile and half carpet but I'd like to change it to tile all the way through the back to the front. Typically, it's going to be a residential tile. Um, the difference is that they, they normally use a special grout that's a little more flexible. The problem you have with tile in a motorhome is that when you go down the road, you have different shifts in that chassis. Even the Safari that has a big chassis that was, I don't know if it was Safari when they were Monaco or Safari before that, but you're still going to get some some movement out of that chassis and the challenge with tile is that they boom, 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 they start to 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 uh, pop out so they, they went with it's a residential tile but it is a grout that has a flexible component to it so it's not the hard grout that stuff will just crack like crazy so um, you need to check with somebody um, you know typically you're gonna have to buy it from um, I would say an RV dealer would be the best or somebody that uh, that does some flooring. I don't know if you're Home Depots and you're, you're, you know, you could check with them and see do you have a type of, of grout that's flexible or not because you've got to be able to have that uh, 
you know, just be able to move enough so that it doesn't. Peter asked, best method to remove stick-on factory metal tile backsplash. Uh, he has a 2017 Winnebago Vista. Stick on tile metal backsplash. So I would, I would imagine, I, I don't know what kind of glue they use to, to put that on there, but if you can get the tile off, then uh, I would try Goo Gone. Um, that's worked very well in a lot of the adhesive that I've used over, over time. Um, I, I guess what I would start with probably is I would call Winnebago Owner Relations and, uh, and talk with Troy in there, or one of the guys, and just, you know, he would know what component, what uh, adhesive was used on that, or would be able to find it out. And every question I've ever asked him, he's known it right off the top of his head. Um, but that, that'll give you a base of, okay, if it's, you know, uh, solvent-based, you can use this stuff. If it's non, you know, whatever, whatever type of adhesive, there is something that works really well to take that off. Waiting on questions. Well, let's see. What other fabulous tricks do we have here that would pertain to winter? To winter? My 7 mil gloves. Of course, that's not a big deal. Um, this was kind of... I don't know if I have a... I got a metal. I got to find something metal. Look at that. Nothing that too big. So this was fun. This is called a the magnet source, and there's times that I need a uh, magnetic screwdriver, but there's times that I don't, especially when I put it in my toolbox. So I just run it through the magnet side here, and I have. It's, it's not going to pick up this heavy. Nope. Well, you can see that normally I could pick up screws and stuff like that. I thought I had a. But anyway, almost, I can almost get that. There we go. So then if I don't want it magnetized, I run it through this side. And you see I have nothing. This is called a puck wrench. And uh, for, for many, many years, Snap-on had to patent on this type of a socket and wrench. It has a rounded uh, edge rather than the sharp edge so when it goes onto the nut it doesn't hit the actual point of the nut it hits the side and that patent wore out so other companies were able to take this this is a socket set that has both SAE and metric because of this design here and it will hit the side so if I have a nut that has gotten stripped on one or two of the points and I can't get a wrench to work on it which can happen a lot when people work on these with screwdrivers and the improper tools before you got them, of course, then I can still get that off with this. O'Reilly Auto Parts called the Puck Wrench and a real handy piece to have in your tool bag. Any questions? That is it. So, well, I guess we have uh, what's coming up this. We have the Tampa Super Show coming. Uh, anybody that's going to be out in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, February 22nd through the 24th, we have another show. And uh, uh, we, we do have some uh, Ask the Expert and chances for people to come in from the RV Repair Club. So we just got a bunch of questions. Okay. Can you please repeat the windshield wand that you were recommended to use? Yes. This is called Clarity Defender, um, and unfortunately, <laughs> well, I take this one because, I'll tell you why, Clarity Defender, how's that? <laughs> They're going to have to work on their packaging. Um, there, is a, it, there is a glass vial in here that the product is in and you have to pinch this with a, a um, pliers and break that so it'll, it'll soak then and coat this. The moisture in the air starts to activate this product so you get about 30 to 40 minutes uh, to apply this to a windshield and that's why they have it inside here and that's why I carry this because it's already 
been used and and I don't I don't get uh, product all over. But it's called Clarity Defender. It's on our website. It's in the store um, at rvrepairclub.com. Susan asked, 2015 Itasca, Itasca. Substar, um, in winter storage now, RV currently is hooked up on landline, while stores monthly, I start engine and run generator. Both are completely dead, generator barely clicks and engine nothing. How to properly jump battery? Should we take batteries out and take to local auto store for charging? We have not checked for sulfates or did any maintenance on the battery since 2015. Since we need something easy, do you recommend buying AGM and battery minder? Yeah. yeah. Um, did, she, did she say at the very beginning it's in storage? Is it plugged in? She said, what is it? She just said in winter storage now. Yeah. And um, start engine completely dead. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it's plugged in anywhere. And and anytime you have your batteries, even though you go once a month or once every three weeks or whatever and start the engine, start the generator and stuff, those batteries will just start to naturally lose a charge. You have the, um, the LP leak detector is going to be drawing off those batteries and, you know, two weeks they'll be dead. I would recommend taking, if, if you can't plug it in, at the storage facility, then I would recommend taking the batteries out and taking them back to your garage and put a battery minder on those batteries. Um, chances are, by, by now, they're probably sulfated, and um, you know you you can uh, bring some of that back. You can break up some of that sulfation if they haven't gone too far. But uh, if you can get them tested, and like I say, you'll probably find that they are. AGMs are absorbed glass mat, and the AGMs are less prone to sulfation, but you still need to have them charged. You still need to, you know, have some type of something on them. And if, if you have a storage facility where you don't have electricity available, but it's outside, you can put a small little solar panel, 40-watt solar panel on it with a battery minder that's going to uh, break up that sulfation. So I would say definitely need to get them out and get them tested. I have a 2009 Winnebago 24J. It's a Winnebago name. It is. Okay. Uh, that is 24J that is new to me. Learning how to use everything and could not find any opening for the drinking water hose to do exit the compartment other than just letting the door hang open. Is this how it's done? Drinking water hose. To exit the compartment. Oh um, no! It should not. It should not be just sticking out of the compartment. There should be some type of a, a plate on the bottom side of the compartment. Now, sometimes, and they've done it different different ways, but um, you'll have a service center, and on one side of the service center, you have the valves and all the stuff that go open the dump tanks and everything, and on the other side, you will have the fresh water, uh, it's called city fill. So that's what she's looking for, drinking water. So you put the city fill onto that. Well, your hose has got to go somewhere and get connected. I have seen um, where they will, um, you can go underneath where the dump station's at, or some of them have a, a little knockout that goes into a separate compartment with another feature at the bottom of that knockout. So I, I, would, I would suggest I'm not familiar exactly with that, but there there has to be something rather than keeping that door open. And one of the things you can do is call Winnebago Owner Relations. Again, those guys will be able to um, have diagrams for it. But it's either through in that service center at the bottom, or sometimes there's a little knockout and it's the next compartment over. All right, this will be the last question for tonight. Okay. Susan asked, hello. Congratulations, Susan. Can we add regular air to nitrogen-filled tires? Yes. Nitrogen, you know, right now, regular air is 80% nitrogen anyway. And so uh, if, if you're, they put nitrogen in it and you're out on the road and you cannot find it, it's perfectly fine to put regular air in that. So, 
We're good. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out and then watching us. Like I say, if you're going to be in the Raleigh area, the February 22nd through the 24th, uh, stop by the show, the North Carolina uh, RV Dealers Association show. We have seminars going all weekend, and uh, hopefully you guys can weather some of the cold weather that's coming in the upper northwest here, or northwest, north, north central, um, and uh, bundle up and stay warm. So thank you very much for coming out. Da, 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 da. Put my little, this is my LED light. I am perfect temperature, 95.3, is that, and do not put this into your eyes or aircraft flying close by. <laughs>